I want to start by reminding you of two definitions that we've come across so far in the course. One is the definition of a linear map, and the other is the definition of a linear subspace. So a map F is linear if, when you apply it to the sum of two vectors, you get the same as if you apply the map first and then add the vectors, and if you apply it to the rescaling of a vector, that's the same as applying it to the vector and then rescaling it. A subspace is linear, or you know, a subset is a linear subspace, if when you take two vectors in that subset and add them, you get another vector in the subset, and if you rescale a vector in the subset, you get another vector in the subset. So it's closed under addition and closed under rescaling. So these two definitions are very, very similar if you look at them. And what we're going to do is, given a linear map, F from Rn to Rm, we will associate to it two subspaces. So one is going to be a subspace of Rn, and that's called the kernel of F, cur F. And the other will be a subspace of Rm, that'll be the image of F, im F. In the next couple of videos we're going to talk about kernel first and then image. So the kernel of F is defined to be the set of vectors v in Rn such that f of v is 0. You could also characterize this as the zero eigenspace of f if f has a notion of eigenspaces if m equals n. Um, but this is more general, right, because m and n don't need to be equal for this to make sense. Um, so let's just do an example and see what the kernel is. Let's take uh, f of v to be a v where a equals 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay, so this is a map from R3 to R3, which is why I've drawn these axes over here. So this is almost the identity, except in the bottom right we have a 0 instead of a 1, and you can check that if I apply a to x, y, z, I just get x, y, 0. So this is a vertical projection onto the x, y plane. In other words, you take a point which sits somewhere in the x direction, somewhere in the y direction, somewhere in the z direction, and you just project it vertically down. Or up, of course, if it's if it starts off below the xy plane, you're projecting it upwards. So what is the kernel of this map? What's the set of points v that go to 0, 0, 0? Well, it's exactly the, um, the z-axis, right? Maybe I'll do the kernel in uh, blue. Actually, that's too dark. Let's, um, let's do it in light blue. All right, that's the kernel. The kernel is the set of all things, which in this case, when you vertically project them, you get to the origin. So it's the set of vectors 0, 0, z in this example. So there was an example very early on when we were looking at, you know, three by two matrices and whatnot, where um, we had, oops, we had a picture like this. I think the matrix was uh, one, two, zero, uh, one. Oh no, it wasn't. It was um, one, zero, minus one, zero, one, minus one. And um, 
So this is a map from R3 to R2. And I'm going to imagine this as projecting uh, onto the XY plane. Um, so when we did this, we worked it out and the X and Y axes are fixed. They stay the same. But the Z axis gets projected again into the XY plane. So this vertical vector here gets projected and it ends up pointing in the minus one minus one direction. So technically this is not a map from R3 to R3. I'm drawing it in that way because I'm just imagining R2 sitting inside R3. But that's just for convenience of drawing it. Um, okay, and what was happening is I'm projecting like this from one, uh, 0, 0, 1 to minus 1, minus 1, 0. So this pink arrow, the direction of the projection, uh, is pointing in the minus 1, minus 1, minus 1 direction. So I think when I was talking about this, if it helps you remember, I was talking about rain falling in this direction and everything kind of follows the rain or light rays. You're projecting uh, the whole of R3 onto the XY plane along these light rays. Uh, and they're all parallel to one another. So in this case, the kernel is exactly the light ray that hits the origin. Just as it was in the previous example, there was this vertical blue line. Here, it's no longer vertical, it, it's slanted. It points in this direction. In other words, this is the set of vectors uh, x, x, x. Okay, so that's how you should imagine the kernel. Um, let's quickly prove that the kernel is a subspace. Right, I've told you it's a subspace. I haven't proved that it's a subspace. So let's prove lemma. Ker F is a subspace. Well, what we need to do is we need to take two vectors V and W in the kernel and check that their sum is also in the kernel. Well, if they're both in the kernel, that means F of V equals zero and F of W equals zero. And what we need to check is that f of v plus w equals 0. That will tell us that the sum is in the kernel. Well, if we compute this, we get f of v plus f of w, which is 0 plus 0, which is 0. So that tells us v plus w is in the kernel. Right? Remember, being in the kernel means f of whatever you are is 0. Right? So if v is in the kernel, then f of v is 0. If w is in the kernel, f of w equals 0. And that's not quite the end of the proof, because we also need to check that f of lambda v equals 0. But again, f is a linear map, so we can pull the lambda out. And now we get 0 because it's lambda times 0. So you see these two definitions that we started with, linearity of a map and being a linear subspace, they play completely analogous roles, right? You use both properties of linearity to prove the two properties of the kernel being a linear subspace. I want to make some remarks about kernels. So, um, first of all, zero is always in the kernel for any linear map f because f of zero equals zero, as we saw last video when we were talking about linear maps. So the kernel is always non-empty. If f is invertible, in other words, if cor f corresponds to an invertible matrix, then ker f equals just zero. Right? There's nothing else in the kernel. This is because um, 
you know if f of v equals zero then v equals f inverse of zero which is zero so the only thing in the kernel is then zero right this was remark one this is remark two you might wonder why it's called kernel well, the way I like to think about this is the kernel is like the hard bit at the center that you can't get rid of and or in a nut or something and um, so you can think of the kernel um, as a solution space for a set of simultaneous equations so if um, f of v equals a v for some matrix a then cur f is the set of solutions to the system of simultaneous equations a v equals zero just by definition and um, what is that set of solutions well that is the set of intersections of the hyperplanes corresponding to the rows of a if you think back to where we talked about simultaneous equations in terms of intersecting hyperplanes the set of solutions uh, sorry each so each row of the matrix gives us a hyperplane um, and the set of solutions is the set where all those hyperplanes intersect right so one of those was uh, a one one v one plus blah 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 plus a uh, one n v n equals zero. That's the first type of plane, and then you you went all the way down to a m one v one plus a m n v n equals zero. Okay, so you have a lot of hyperplanes, m hyperplanes, and the set where they intersect um, is called the kernel because it's kind of what's left over after you've finished intersecting all these guys. I don't know if that's really why it's called that, that's just how I like to think about it. Now, when we talked about systems of simultaneous equations, um, remember we had a v equals b as the, the general equation. So I just want to prove a lemma. Uh, we've actually already seen this, um, I just want to reiterate it because it's I don't know, in this new language. Um, so consider the simultaneous equations A V equals B, where A is a matrix, A, a is uh, an M by N matrix, and B is a vector in R M. Um, and let f of v be the linear map a v so then um, the space of solutions if it's not empty is well remember it's not a linear subspace it's an affine subspace it doesn't have to pass through the origin and which affine subspace is it? Well, it's a translate of the kernel of F. So this is not saying anything deep. Let me just give you an example. Um, you know, let's suppose a is this matrix one zero 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 one zero 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 zero. So F is this vertical projection. So now saying A V equals B. Uh, let's suppose B is in the X Y plane, because otherwise we're not going to be able to solve this, right? Because A of V, anything of the form A V is in the xy plane so if b is in the xy plane then the set of v's such that a of v equals b is just the set of all things living vertically over b 
right so let's suppose this is uh, B here um, so saying AV equals B is saying V lives directly above B right because A is the vertical projection so if A of V equals B, then V has to live directly above B. And this vertical line is parallel to this vertical line, the one that goes through the origin, which was the kernel. Right, if I just zoom back up again. This vertical blue line was the kernel of this matrix A. And, you know, being parallel is saying you are just a translate, right? You've taken this blue line, you've translated it until it passes through B. So the proof of this lemma, I'm not actually going to write it out in full because we've, we've actually already seen the proof. So the proof, if you look back at the video on simultaneous equations uh, and the geometric interpretation of them, then what we proved was... Um, Maybe this was video 17 or 18. So what we saw was that if um, if V0 is a solution um, then the set of all solutions is the affine subspace V0 plus and then there was something I think I called U where U is the set of all V such that A V equals 0 so this is precisely the kernel of F or the kernel you could also call it the kernel of A that's fine you know that's just another name for the same thing um, and so this is saying you take the kernel of F, kernel of A, whatever you want to call it, and you translate it by V0. So this was proved back in an earlier video. In particular, what we see is that if... Um, a V equals B has a solution then it has a k-dimensional space of solutions where k is the dimension of the kernel of F right because if as soon as you've got one solution you know by this lemma you get any other solution by taking the kernel and translating it till it passes through that point so there's a one solution for every point in the kernel in this example here as long as B is in the XY plane there's a one-dimensional space of solutions And remember when we talked about this uh, that k, the dimension of the space of solutions, is just the number of free variables in the general solution. So the number of free variables of the matrix um, in when you put it into reduced echelon form. So, for example, this matrix up here, A, is already in reduced echelon form. Um, and the first two variables are leading variables, and that leaves one free variable. And that's why we have a one-dimensional solution space. So, this is all stuff we've kind of seen before. I'm just saying it in a slightly different language. Um, this number has another name.
so uh, let's put a box around it so this number is called the nullity of the matrix or the nullity of F nullity because right, null means zero and kernel is the set of things that go to zero so this is the dimension of the kernel right so the dimension of the kernel is called the nullity of the matrix and it's the dimension of the space of solutions of a v equals b assuming that has any solutions so what we're working towards is a theorem that relates the nullity of A to another quantity called the rank of A, which is going to be the dimension of the image. That's called the rank nullity theorem, and we're going to come across that in the next video.